Here with another in-depth True North Initiative feature, I'm joined by best-selling author and columnist and host and recording artist and human rights activist Mark Stein. Mark, good to be with you. Hey, good to be with you, Andrew. Now, I just realized we I've interviewed you many times, yeah. never in the same place. There was one time we were close. We were in the same city, but right. we, we ended up doing it remotely. So yeah, yeah. I, I've had to like truck through like the foothills of New England to get here, but we've, yeah, we've yeah, done it and we're yeah. in the same yeah, room. Yeah, no, now we're knee to knee, so... <laughs> Uh, you can ask me about the most shameful and embarrassing moments of my life, and I'll just open up to you and spill the beans. Okay, embarrassing moments. Uh, wh wh who have you been interviewed by before me that uh, that might uh, <laughs> eclipse this one? We'll see. <laughs> Let's talk about immigration for a moment, because first off, I had to clear it to get here to interview mm. you, but you've actually been talking about this to an American audience for quite a while, and, and immigration was probably one of the key issues in the last election. And in Canada, it only seems to be just now that people are actually talking about it. And I mean, Stephen Harper continued to increase immigration numbers, but even then it was never as central to the national discussion as it is in Canada now. No, I, I think you're right that it was the issue with Donald Trump. And that's true today if you go to his rallies, but it was certainly true during the campaign. Uh, I, in fact, I think I was there the very first night uh, he turned it into a chant when he talked about building the wall and then he said, and who's going to pay for it? And everybody in the, the hall yelled back, Mexico. Uh, it, was, it was central because I think people had concluded uh, that mass immigration uh, did nothing for the people who were already here in the country. And that's actually the, the way you're meant to look at it. If, if you notice the way people talk about People before Trump, people talked about immigration in terms of uh, the immigrants' point of view. We need to bring them out of the shadows and that kind of thing. It's not really an American issue, I would say. I, uh, my view is that no developed nation needs mass immigration uh, for the basic reason that 30% of all jobs uh, are expected to vanish uh, in the next uh, 15 years or so. So the idea that you constantly, the, the, the argument they made after the Second World War is, oh, we need people to come here to be our nurses and to be our bus drivers and to be whatever it is. That argument no longer applies in an age of automation. Uh, and so I think the, um, the, the economic rationale for immigration has vanished. And what that leaves in countries like Canada is basically the virtue signaling <laughs> argument uh, for immigration, which is that uh, we admit all these people from around the world because uh, it makes us feel good about ourselves. And I don't think that's going to fly much longer either. No, and in Canada, mm. when the big discussion was admitting Syrian refugees, mm. there was the big discussion about what were considerably small numbers. Do we go with 25,000 mm. or 50,000? And when Justin Trudeau said, we're going to do 50,000, everyone said, oh, that's too much too quickly. And you'd think that would be a moment of reckoning, but instead it becomes a, an open the floodgate scenario. And over right. the last two years, year and a half, we've had tens of thousands mm. of people flooding across the border illegally, a government that isn't prepared or, or willing to deal with it. And it, it's taken that for Canadians to start to have any discussion whatsoever about immigration that isn't in that virtue signaling realm. No, and I think the, I think what's interesting about that, I mean, to me, one of the interesting things about uh, Canada in generally, gen, gen, in general, is that uh, unless francophones object to it, <laughs> uh, whatever your objection is goes nowhere. Um, and what is interest, what is interesting to me is that in some respects that encounter between a Perlen Quebecer, uh, not far from where we're sitting right now, actually at Saint Anne de Sabrevois, uh, and Justin Trudeau, where he because she objected to having uh, Trudeau's virtue signaling, uh, the cost of his virtue signaling dumped on her province, um, he told her she had no place in Canada. In other words, it's like a state ideology. Uh, if, you, if you object to uh, pointless mass immigration as a kind of virtue signaling, uh, there is no place for you in Canada. And uh, I thought that was an astonishing thing for uh, the leader of a democratic society to say to a citizen, just not appropriate. 
Don't know the papers at all. Yes, and we actually had a few weeks ago the immigration minister in, in mm. Canada saying that Doug Ford, the premier mm. of Ontario, and one of his ministers were racist because they were raising issues mm. about the influx of asylum seekers. And you used to associate that rhetoric with these people in the dark corners of the internet or these mm. campus social justice warriors. We're talking about now ministers of the crown, the prime minister of mm. Canada. And th this rhetoric is is very dangerous in a way because they are trying to say that criticism of this thing or criticism of your government is inherently equivalent to racism. Yeah, and, and it's because uh, the, the unique thing about Canada, of course, is that multiculturalism is an official policy, uh, which, and it has been since uh, Justin's Father's Day, and it shouldn't have been. But I think the appropriate response, I, I mean, I'm not in favor of state ideologies, and I don't care whether that's uh, communism or Nazism or these fluffy bunny things like multiculturalism. Um, I think there's a real question. Uh, I, I, I think it offends against the maxims of prudence. And as you go around the Western world, uh, the fetishization of multiculturalism um, has actually been... Uh, I would say, I, I mean, I do think, for example, in Sweden, that it will actually destroy Sweden. Um, so it's not a small thing. And I, it's interesting to me that Canada, in some sense, you, you, you've seen, particularly in Europe, but to a, a lesser extent in other parts uh, of the Commonwealth, uh, in Britain and Australia, uh, voices raised against that view of uh, post-war society. And Canada's really one of the last to have gotten into that, I would say. You mentioned earlier the Quebecer approach yeah. to this thing. And, and what's interesting is that when it comes to any discussion of Canadian values yeah, or, or yeah. values in general, and, and a lot of these divides, you aren't allowed to have these discussions in English Canada the way you can in, in French Canada. And yeah, I mean, you yeah. look at the face covering ban, for example, a policy that never would have flown anywhere outside of Quebec, but in Quebec there's a, enough of a contingent for it. And I'm wondering why that is. Why is it because their <laughs> Quebecers are the victim groups and no one can criticize their approach to it, or is there something else? Well, no, I think it's, I think it's more, in a sense, Canada is a microcosm in that respect of uh, the broader approach in the rest of the Western world. So I can understand the, the Globe and Mail, for example, when they brought in the ban about uh, fate in Quebec about fate. The, the, the Globe and Mail and English Canada in general said, this is ridiculous, the idea of the state uh, telling you what kind of clothes you can wear, which I think if you're, in, uh, if you're used to English law, uh, the idea of the, the state pronouncing on particular garments that are favored or not favored is slightly odd. But, but it, outside the English world, in continental Europe, for example, uh, 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 kneecap bans have become quite common. Uh, and, the, and there's, I forget how many European countries it's up to by now, but several ones have simply said, uh, no, this is banned, you can't do it, you can't wear this stuff in public. So in a sense, Canada's like a microcosm. The divide between English Canada and French Canada is uh, is in a sense a microcosm of the of the split in the wider West, and I would say my old friend uh, Boris Johnson, for example, shortly after he stepped down as uh, Foreign Secretary in the UK, um, and he was saying he he didn't like burkas, and he said they reminded him of uh, letterboxes, as they call them. They look yes. like a uh, <laughs> looks like this the the slot you stick the letter in. He said that. Uh, and he got into a whole lot of trouble, and he wound up being investigated as a hate monger and all the way. And it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. You know, I've been there, and it's <laughs> Boris's turn. They come for everyone eventually. But what was interesting to me uh, w was that uh, his preamble to that was he'd said he wasn't in favor of these European-style mm -hmm. uh, bans on covered women in public. Uh, but it still didn't save him from being damned as an Islamophobe. And that's the interesting, that's what's interesting to me about this kind of, converse, uh, this kind of conversation, um, is that even if you just offer the mildest criticism of all this, um, you, you, it's enough to get damned as an Islamophobe, a thisophobe, a thatophobe, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and I, I think there's something sad about that. I don't like when you're, you know, just to pick somewhere at, ra at random, Brampton, Ontario. I don't like to see covered women in Brampton. I think it's sad. Um, 
And I think if you were to look at uh, almost, you know, what what are we now coming up to seventy seventy years of uh, uh, the uh, independence in uh, the Indian subcontinent? And if you had said to like Jinnah, uh, the founder, the first Governor General of uh, independent Pakistan, if you had said to him uh, that in uh, the so-called old Commonwealth that you would see huge numbers of covered women walking the streets of English cities, Canadian cities, Australian cities in 1948. He'd have thought you were stark staring nuts, and he would not have thought it was a good thing. So when we bring that back to really the broader discussion, is it one of assimilation then? Well, um, I'm not, I don't know what people are meant to assimilate with in Canada because you have this, uh, you have this situation, which we saw in the sesquicentennial, which is like a tragedy. You know, I felt kind of upset for my <laughs> kids because um, e everyone should have like a great anniversary uh, for their country once. And it should have been a tremendous birthday party uh, the way the uh, centennial was in 1967. Instead, it was a real sort of buzz killer. Uh, the way it was handled. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because, which, which again comes back to what are you meant to assimilate with? Uh, we're told that the first prime minister of Canada is like a hate monger and you have to take his <laughs> yes. uh, uh, statue. Well, what the, why they, so, so let's say you come here from Yemen or Sudan or wherever uh, and you settle in Canada and uh, you pick up a newspaper. You think, oh, it's great. I want to be Canadian. Uh, what do they tell you? That the guys who founded your country are, are hate mongers and racists and all the way. Why the hell would you want to assimilate with that? I mean, that's, that's, that's not just an issue for Canada. But that's an issue, for, again, for almost every Western society these days. I know you interviewed Kelly Leach during the conservative leadership race. And, and at the time, she was pilloried by the press and the liberals mm. and all of that for not even specifically defining Canadian values, but mm. by saying there is such a thing as Canadian mm. values. And I have to ask you, can you bring it back? Can you bring back that idea of a country that is not afraid of saying, yes, this is what a Canadian is, this is what Canada is? Well, I think you have to. And I think ca Canada was really the pioneer of that because I mentioned Sweden. Uh, Sweden was basically an homogenous society until about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. When it, de when it decided that was no longer cool and that the, uh, the things like the Canadian model were much cooler. But the idea that, you know, Canada is like a, uh, is like a stamp collection. You know, you just want to have one of everything. And it's <laughs> not, it doesn't, and, 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 and Canada in that sense is simply, and you know this when you look at any of the official advertising uh, for Canada or Canadian identity. They sell themselves as a kind of, uh, you know, the government sells Canada as a sort of microcosm of the world, in fact. And, 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 and in a sense, this was the conscious thing that Trudeau did, um, in part uh, because he thought it would help uh, weaken French uh, separatism. In, instead of stating the obvious reality, uh, to look at the... Uh, Canadian coat of arms, which has the uh, uh, emblems of England, Scotland, Ireland, and France. They're the four founding nations of modern Canada uh, and of, of the dominion of Canada. And uh, this idea that, you know, we're supposed to deny reality and, and pretend that, uh, in fact, instead it's just uh, a, a coalition of whoever happens to be in there. And I, I find people like, people I have a modicum of respect for, like Louise Arbour, the former uh, Supreme Court uh, judge who I debated on stage in Toronto. And it doesn't matter what you say, you know, you mentioned Somalis. And she said, well, maybe we have a lot to learn from Somalis. I don't know. I don't think, I don't think she actually means that. I don't think she wants to live in a society that has Somali characteristics for a moment. But in a sense, uh, she's not doing anything unusual. She's doing. She's following the logic of Canadian multiculturalism, which to say, which is to say that uh, Somali values are are no uh, better or worse than French values. And uh, at a certain level, I think somewhere deep down, she understands. 
the, the, the that's meaningless mumbo jumbo. But at the same time, if you if you live in a land of meaningless mumbo jumbo for long enough, it sort of starts to come true. Well, you look at the now official catchphrase of Canada, diversity is our strength. I yeah, mean, yeah. that's the type of thing where if some politician says it, it might not mean anything, no, 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 but no, that but, is actually guiding no, policy. No, but that actually, diversity is our strength. I can't stand that because diversity is morally neutral. And you can have uh, five nice ladies like Madame Arbor, five nice CBC listening ladies of uh, d'un certain age, uh, who uh, uh, like to listen to CBC radio, uh, and that group of five ladies done certain age is not in the least bit diverse. So you add to them uh, Sudan's leading clitoridectomy practitioner. Uh, and you've made it more diverse, but you haven't necessarily made it better. Diversity is an entirely morally neutral term. Uh, and the and and, ju and simply saying diversity makes our is our strength with a glassy eyed expression because you've been told it ever since kindergarten does not actually make it so. I think you should actually pitch that to like the replacement of the view. You know, mm -hmm. Sedan's leading clitoridectomy specialist, you, yeah. Louise Arbor, and and everyone else. <laughs> hey, it would make that show a lot more interesting. <laughs> but you bring up. Oh, the... well, actually, let's let's not start with the view. This cockamamie thing they've got on the National since Peter Mansbridge retired. <laughs> They've got like four anchors carefully yes. selected according to some CBC focus group thing. <laughs> Sticks Sudan's leading clitoridectomy practitioner in the middle of the national as, as the fifth host. <laughs> When you bring up that idea of diversity being morally neutral, it, I find it to be a fascinating one because the point that I've made is that Trudeau sees diversity as the end game, whereas mm -hmm. I've always viewed diversity a, as some natural thing that might emerge when you're pursuing other values like free speech and, and free mm -hmm. association mm -hmm. and economic opportunity and, and all of these things. But diversity is itself the ideology. And, and the right. question becomes how much the politicians advancing that are, are going to ignore everything else. And yeah. I think that this border crossing crisis we have in Canada is showing that they're prepared to look the other way on, on pretty much everything just to get to that diversity. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting to me is that uh, uh, during the years of conservative government, uh, conservatives did not even challenge that. I would say, you know, for example, Jason Kenney is a very smart man uh, in many respects. Um, you could almost rely during, during the entire... Uh, time of Mr. Harper's uh, ministry in Ottawa, you could pick up a paper almost any day of the week, and there would be uh, Jason Kenney in some semi-national costume <laughs> of whichever particular community group he happened to be, and and uh, there he he would be with a group of Hmong Canadians or Tajik Canadians or uh, whatever celebrating their particular national day, and it and it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting to me. I think it's a sort of indulgence of. Um, I think it's the the, the in, I, I think I think it's basically. I think it's the latter day equivalent of colonial condescension. You know, you had had to put on uh, your uh, pith helmet or your solar topi and go off to Africa or Asia to condescend to the natives. And I think uh, I think in in the modern Western world. We sort of decided uh, we could we could get the same frisson as old school colonialism by bringing the natives here, so we could condescend to them closer to home. I think that's all it is, really. At the Conservative Party of Canada's policy convention mm. in August, they actually the members of the party voted on adopting a policy that would eliminate birthright citizenship. Right. And this I find interesting, and I don't think it would ever be actually run on. I mean, they, they can vote for whatever they want, and that doesn't mean Andrew Scheer will, will talk about it in the, in the election. But, but a policy like this, what's your take on it? Because even Trump, for all of his you know, supposed racism and thisism right. and thatism, hasn't uh, put forward this definitively yet. Well, he, he is against birthright citizenship. What's interesting to me is that there's only really of the developed nations, it's only really Canada and America that have birthright citizenship. Mm. And if you look at, for example, health care policy in Canada, the reason Canada has its health system is because it defines its health care in opposition to America. So mm -hmm. if you say in Canada, why don't we have a health care system like Italy? They say, well, I don't know. What is that? All we know is ours isn't like America. Whatever America's is, uh, we're not like America's system.
And so it's interesting to me that that doesn't apply on birthright citizenship. And uh, essentially, uh, it's only America and Canada that have it. For example, in Ireland, um, you, you, you're, if you're born in Ireland, you have to uh, uh, be born either to a citizen of Ireland or of the United Kingdom in order to be a citizen mm -hmm. of Ireland at birth. Same, similar thing in Australia. Uh, and if you think about it, that that that's far more rational. Uh, and France and other uh, continental countries are the same. That's far more rational than simply saying uh, a, a lady gets off the plane uh, eight months and three weeks pregnant uh, and she checks into a hospital and delivers an American citizen or a Canadian citizen. Now, in the U.S., it exists supposedly because of... Uh, uh, Article 14 of the U.S. Constitution so supposedly licenses birthright citizenship. It's never actually been tested at the Supreme Court mm. level, that proposition. But everybody's super craven in, a, in, in America about going against uh, so-called anchor babies, birthright citizens, birthright, so-called birthright citizenship. In Canada, it's actually um, a hangover of empire because... it. it it, it goes back to before there was Canadian citizenship, mm. when uh, there was just um, the uh, uh, everyone within uh, His Majesty's dominions was a British subject, and that was it. And there were no subcategories uh, of citizenship underneath one uh, generally imperial view of everybody within the empire as a subject of the crown. And uh, so... So before they created Canadian citizenship, they, they, everyone wants to control their borders, and the Canadian government was no different. Um, so, so they created a sort of a, a kind of pre-citizenship idea of someone, uh, a, a British subject who is born in Canada, uh, is, is a, as a kind of prototype Canadian. Uh, to distinguish between someone born in Kingston on a British subject born in Kingston, Ontario, as opposed to one born in Kingston on Thames or Kingston, Jamaica or Kingston, mm -hmm. wherever. And what's interesting to me is then when they created Canadian citizenship as a subset of British nationality in uh, in the in the nineteen uh, uh, forty uh, in nineteen forty seven. Um, that that was sort of preserved in there, that idea that being born in Canada is what makes you Canadian, which is why Ted Cruz, <laughs> as you know, uh, was born in Canada and under the uh, 1947 uh, Canadian Citizenship Act, he was born a, citizen, a Canadian citizen and a British subject. And I used to get, when I was on the Rush Limbaugh show and I'd be making jokes about Ted Cruz as Canadian, all the Ted Cruz supporters hated it. But that's like a fact. That's a fact. He was born a British subject and a Canadian citizen, Ted Cruz. And you can't do anything, uh, uh, and, and he can't do any, even though, even though in his case, neither of his parents were Canadian. So I can see... Uh, why that would bother him. Uh, uh, the Duke of Wellington was once described as an Irishman. And he said a man can be born in a stable and it doesn't make him a horse. And <laughs> Ted Cruz looks on Canada as being born in a stable and he doesn't want to be called a horse. Um, and so I think that whole view of citizen, that whole, um, it, it, in the Canadian context, the birthright citizenship basically uh, predates uh, the creation of Canadian citizenship in the 1940s, uh, and and uh, and I think essentially is uh, well and uh, well and the other thing about it too is that originally when I think it's around the time of the uh, First World War, it's about a century, but they they started to do uh, they started to distinguish between British subjects born in Canada and British subjects born in the rest of the empire. And that's, that was really the logic behind so-called birthright citizenship, is it's not to mean that if, you know, somebody gets off the plane from Tajikistan and has a baby at the Royal Victoria in Montreal that uh, that, that, that baby is Canadian. It was a way for the government of Canada uh, to distinguish between the people for whom it was responsible – 
uh, and people elsewhere within the Commonwealth. And and so this idea that it now it now means you get off the plane, you give birth, and you've given birth to a Canadian citizen uh, is not how it was intended, and actually is a perversion of how the thing uh, the thing was uh, originally set up. You see this in the discussions in the United States about illegal immigration there as mm. well, and in this broader entitlement. And what you're describing seems to stem from that same phenomenon, where, where this entitlement that people have in all areas mm. of their life extends to uh, international borders. And right. I, I've heard Canadians, for example, talk about you know the lack of rights and freedoms you have going into another country, and right. they get all huffy about it. And I know you're no fan of, of crossing international borders, but... But again, you do not have a right to go into another country and start calling the shots. And, and that seems to have been lost, that idea. No, I find that, I find that odd because um, I'm, I'm uh, an immigrant to the United States. And, and every, if I go on Fox News and I talk about immigration, I say, oh, I don't know why you're talking about this. You're an immigrant. <laughs> so uh, I, I, yeah, I, I know that. That's not news to me. And I, I accept uh, that my presence in the United States is in the gift of the government of the United States. And if the government of the United States said, uh, we don't want you here, bugger off and don't come back, I, I think they have the every right to do that. And what I find odd about, for example, a view of immigration, uh, and it's revealing to me this, if you talk to like Louise Arbour, who we mentioned, is their idea that somehow the host nation now has to assimilate to the immigrants. So, for example, you can have a country that's, uh, you know, uh, got 50-50, uh, uh, for the sake of argument, let's just say like, like Canada. You've got some uh, Anglo-Celts and you've got a French-speaking minority. Mm -hmm. But then let's say you, you let in uh, people uh, from um, Indonesia. And so Canada becomes 20% Indonesian. And then they start saying, well, these Indonesians can't relate to certain things about Canada. They, uh, you know, they, they can't relate to uh, Boxing Day, and they can't relate to the monarchy, and they can't relate to Hockey Night in Canada, and they can't relate to... And, 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 you th and, and so we need to change these things because they can't relate to them. And you, and you, you think just... Uh, and, and very few people actually stop and think, well, hang on a minute. In that case, why did they come here? You know, I can't, I, I for, for, uh, for example, in Sudan, I can't relate to people killing each other with machetes. And, uh, and that's why I think twice about moving to Sudan. And, but if I got to Sudan, I would be very surprised to switch on whatever the Sudanese equivalent of the national is. And then say, well, now we've 15% of the population is uh, Canadian and uh, they can't relate to uh, people macheteing each other uh, all to bits. And so, uh, you know, maybe we ought to uh, be thinking about uh, introducing hockey and poutine. I would find that very... Nobody expects the Sudanese to look at it that way. But in, in the Western world, we expect um, the host nation increasingly to assimilate with the uh, immigrants. And that's why the British Labour Party now is virulently anti-Semitic, because there's a democratic, demographic logic to that. Uh, and that's why you have uh, extraordinary levels of sexual assault in Sweden. Uh, and that's why in Toulouse in France, Jews cannot walk about with identifying uh, 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 signs, outward signs of their faith, mm. and why the gay bars are folding in Amsterdam, because the host nations are assimilating with the immigrants. You have this tragic case in Iowa where an illegal kills a, a young 20-year-old 20 year, 20 year college student, and then you have lawmakers in the U.S., Democrats, calling for the prosecution of the people that are supposed to get the illegals out of the country and, and right. the dismantling of ICE. And even in Canada, for all of its permissiveness and state multiculturalism, mm. we don't talk about arresting or, or shutting down border enforcement. Uh, but perhaps that's because our border enforcement is not uh, being <laughs> ordered to do anything right now. But but do you see this as being a blip or do you see this as being the new reality of, of the Western left? No, I, I think it's actually the ultimate expression of... Uh, of, of, of modern progressivism um, that uh, which you see in the protests uh, certainly south of the border in the United States uh, 
uh, they they deny that borders are a thing. Um, in when when I went to see uh, uh, Trump speak in Burlington, Vermont, when he was campaigning, which is the heart of uh, Bernie Sanders' fiefdom in Vermont, Bernie Stan, and there were these uh, there were so it was like a great carnival atmosphere, and there were all these right wing, left wing protesters all over the streets, people who wanted to see Trump, people who hated Trump. And on the, uh, on the left wing side of the street, um, there were all these guys uh, holding up signs saying, we don't want your racist fear. Immigrants are welcome here. Well, I've been, you know, in, uh, in Vermont and northern New England <laughs> for many decades now. And I can't say I've ever found that immigrants are welcome here particularly. That's my, maybe just me. Uh, maybe that's just this particular immigrant. But, but, but. Those people actually are living, in, they're, they're actually publicly committed to the idea uh, that there are six and a half billion people uh, around the world who aren't American and they should all be entitled to move here. And that's increasingly the view of apparently sane people in the United States and in, now, if you look at, if, if you look at it, because the, I think this is actually mm -hmm. going to happen, so this proposition will be tested. Not in North America, but in Europe, because if you look at Africa, you're going to have an, a demographic explosion where countries that uh, can't support their present populations are going to have six times that population uh, by, towards the end of the century. Now, is it likely that a country that can't support 10 million people is going to be able to support 60 million people? No. They're all going to get on uh, little boats and go across the Mediterranean and go to Spain and Italy and wherever they can. And if you think about it, there's roughly a billion people in the developed world. There's, you know, like three, whatever it is, uh, 380 million in, uh, in, in North America and there's uh, 500 million in Europe and uh, there's a few bits and bobs in Japan and Australia and New Zealand and so forth. Uh, and there's six billion people who are in the rest of the world. And a relatively small percentage of that has to decide to move uh, to the developed world uh, just, just to sort of capsize it. And I think uh, for in, in that, from that point of view, those people who say, we don't, we don't want borders, uh, we are the world, we are the children, we are the future, we're all the same, it doesn't matter... Uh, whether you're Louise Arbour or you're a headhunter in the jungles of New Guinea, we're all the same. Those people are going to get a chance to test that thesis a lot sooner than they think. Mark Stein, thank you very much. My pleasure, Andrew. All right. For the True North Initiative, I'm Andrew Lawton.